Sometimes you have to ask the hard questions when you're making a podcast. This one? What's the name of this next one? Uh, that next looks one. like a, a, a chocolate or bread ball or so. The next one is called Bunuelo. Bunuelo. You're listening to some of the painstaking research that went into this episode. Can you describe it? Like, it, it kind of looks like you would play with it out on a, a field. It's like almost the size of a tennis ball, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. It's brown on the outside and it has like kind of a hard out, outer shell, like a light brown outer shell. And then you cut it open and it's like this spongy bread on the inside. Truth be told, one of the hardest parts about researching any diverse community, especially Alni, is trying not to gain an extra pant size. We are at La Calenita, a Colombian bakery on 5th Street. And we're trying some pan de bono. Kier, what did you think about the pan de bono? It was fantastic. It looks like a flattened dinner roll that uh, could be seen as a biscuit or something. It's, it's very similar to, like, I would say a Colombian biscuit. And, yeah, it's a little thicker than what you would have in your normal baguette bread, but it has a little bit of a cheesy flavor to it. So I think that they add cheese, and it's very sultry. Not the kind of thing you want to eat during your diet, uh, but a great accompaniment to a coffee for breakfast. You could spend a lifetime exploring all the food in Alni without ever reaching the bottom. But if you had to start somewhere, you can't go wrong with the Colombian bakery and restaurant La Calenita on North 5th Street. It's a small cafe with about a half a dozen tables, but the place is packed with culture. Even with our masks on, the sights and smells of the place came rushing at us. The names of Latin American countries decorate the walls next to coolers of soft drinks. You smell the plates of huevos, carne asada, and arepas cooking in the kitchen. And there's a pastry counter that I could stare at forever, full of delicious sounding baked goods like besitos. Do you want pan de bono? Yeah. You, you gotta try it. Cafe? So, yeah, you want coffee or you want hot chocolate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, It wasn't my first time at La Calenita, but it was our first time as a production team. Kier and I and June Lopez, whose voice you're about to hear along with ours. Not only was everything delicious, this was one of the only in-person gatherings that the pandemic afforded us over the entire creation of this podcast. So it was extra memorable. Romano. Oh, Romano. Well, you're making a queso con el pan? Huh? No, thanks. Este tiene más queso. A mí no tiene el sabor de queso. We started breaking down the pastries in Spanish at one point, talking over what we each thought they were made of. Food is literally part of our shared humanity because we all have a need to replenish and nourish to survive. But the act of sharing meals together, many argue, is just as essential as feeding the body. The labor activist and civil rights leader Cesar Chavez once said, if you really want to make a friend, go to someone's house and eat with him. The people who gave you their food give you their heart. Food is a powerful way to share culture, which is one of the reasons why food is so intertwined with memory. It's a topic that I think about a lot. I feel like I'm always hungry and Food is just such a big part of every day. You know, it's like a human need, uh, but it's also something that connects us to our culture. And we've done a lot in our own creative practice around food. 
one of the first projects that we worked on together as as a collective with Amber Art and Design was um, a project called The Village Table. And we were working with the Village of Arts and Humanities. And we were, were also working with people in the neighborhood in North Philadelphia to create recipes that were based on food that grows locally and also seasonally, but also to tap into what foods remind people of their culture. This was recorded on another walk in the woods and to host meals with different food items, um, different plates that were symbolic and were meaningful to different people to their culture, whether it was a meal that their grandmother made or something that, you know, um, somebody in their family made, something that reminds them of home, those meals would be featured and shared. And it was a way to not only share food and sustenance, but also to share culture and have conversation, to learn about other people's culture, to share stories. And um, I thought about that a lot, how food connects me to culture, how food connects to memory as well. The Village Table was the name of that project. It's amazing what can happen when you bring people together to share food. It became a vehicle to not only share healthy and diverse meals, in a way we created a forum to discuss aspects of the community pertaining to things like urban agriculture and food justice. Well, one of the things that I loved about our Village Table project is that we were really looking to honor, put a spotlight and celebrate really the unheralded chefs and the unheralded artists that are usually included within each household. And these are people that have been procuring their craft for their entire lifetime and lifespan and is regenerative, meaning that they probably learned from somebody that was an elder to them and their family, whether it be their parents or their grandparents, these traditions that get carried up from other places and uh, other, other points of origin. You carry these traits with you from wherever your family might have originated from to wherever you're going. And cooking is one of the biggest representations of that origin story. And so when we were doing the village table, we were, we were looking to really celebrate a lot of these, these recipes that, that people have been generating and really providing the, the resources, the nutrition for their families to mature and grow. And not a once a month type of spotlight like a theater show or something that goes on tour. These are people that usually after a long day of work have to come home and cook an entire meal for their family. But in doing so, they're also procreating the aspects of their culture that they've carried many generations with them through many landscapes and, and environments and geographical locations and are usually directly related to the landscape that uh, one is created into. We hope to serve up some of the same with this episode. A space to share stories of unsung people, the stories behind their dishes, and to highlight the folks who think about growing and nourishing on the everyday. Before William Penn colonized what we now know as the state of Pennsylvania in the late 17th century, the only section of Philadelphia was home to a community of Lenape Indians. These particular Lenape were known to be tall, incredibly peaceful, and a spiritual people. Their totem was a turtle, because they had a legend that at one point, the entire world balanced on the back of a giant turtle. They shared a name with the language they spoke, the Unami, which means people downriver. Only is remarkably different today, of course. The people downriver, the Unami, were displaced long ago by English colonists. And in the context of modern Philly, the neighborhood is something of an upriver community. On a map, only lies at the tippy top of the city. It borders Montgomery County and is the second to last stop on the northbound Broad Street subway line. 
But the neighborhood is also upriver in the sense that it doesn't seem shy to go against the current. It's a neighborhood with a blue collar tradition that's been revitalized in recent decades, but without the levels of gentrification that we've seen in so many other parts of the city. Over the last 20 years, Olney has become increasingly non white. It's a true melting pot, home to large communities of Korean, Colombian, and Mexican immigrants, along with families from Africa and the Caribbean. Researchers believe it is the most linguistically diverse part of Philadelphia. More than one in three people who live there was born outside the United States. In this podcast, we're going to introduce you to some of them and hear why this neighborhood is so special. You'll also hear about the history of Olney, including the racism some people faced as the neighborhood grew less white. You'll hear from chefs and artists, teenagers and teachers, pastors and nonprofit leaders. You'll hear about its food, its thriving business community, and its built environment. A co production of Olney Culture Lab of Culture Trust Greater Philadelphia and Amber Art and Design, in partnership with June Lopez and Malcolm Burnley. This is Audio Only, a podcast exploring the beauty, complexity, and diversity of the only section of Philadelphia. We hope you enjoy. Major support for the Audio Only podcast is provided by the Independence Public Media Foundation. Additional support is provided by the William Penn Foundation and Collins Family ShopRite. We started episode four with a recording from an event inside the North Fifth Street office of the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia. It's where we recorded the Lenape land acknowledgement. We mentioned at the time that there was rice porridge being served for breakfast that day, but we didn't tell you why this particular dish was being served or even its name. Well, it's called babor, and if you've ever had kanji, this is like a brothy version of that. Babor is made with subtle variations across Cambodian homes in the U.S., but the staples of the dish are white rice, boiling water of some kind of stock, and besides that, toppings galore, whatever you want. Fish sauce, it can be added to make a custom bowl of babor. In this case, there was a table of accompaniments in back that included things like salted soybean paste, fresh sprouts and herbs, crushed nuts, and even a basket of fried donuts, which were sliced into tiny slivers like a baguette. In the 80s, Olney became one of the major hubs for Cambodian resettlement on the East Coast. Although the population in Philly is estimated to be roughly 8,000 on the census, there's a good chance that's underestimating the real number. The Cambodian identity itself is very complicated, right? So you have you have, um, a, in, in the Philadelphia area, there's a lot of ethnic Chinese from Cambodia that we service, but on paper, they might list Chinese, but not necessarily Cambodian. Um, but they are also the store owners of Cambodian shops, right? So it's really interesting how that works. And then we also have individuals who are Khmer Krong, who are Khmer Cambodians from South Vietnam, but when asked, they might write Vietnam because of their nationality being li- linked to, so to Vietnam. A lot of the, Individuals we service in North Philadelphia from the last few decades has been about 40%, 45% South Vietnamese, Cambodians. That's Sarun Chan, the executive director of the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia. So if you're thinking about data and how big the community is in Philadelphia, it's very skewed. Uh, we know our population is more than the listed 8,000 individuals that the census listed in 2010. Um, way more than that. And of course, everyone's been popping out babies. Uh, so of course, that's going to multiply. Um, so I'm excited that our community continues to grow. Uh, and it's, it's been amazing. Sarun was giving a presentation about the history of Cambodian-American refugee resettlement in Philly and the current needs of the community. He didn't talk about Babor, but it comes out of the same history. When there was less rice to go around during the Khmer Rouge genocide of the late 70s, Babor was a popular way to stretch the starchy rice by soaking it in hot water and spices. And it served a nostalgic purpose, while remaining a food staple of many Cambodian American families since coming over. Babor is a one-pot meal that can be made with limited space and combined with any meat or vegetable. 
so this is a typical scene when we first arrived as refugees in America. We were put into one bedroom houses. Uh, this would be like a, a typical, like, let's say a, one family in one bedroom in a whole entire house. I remember when my family first arrived, we were, there's six of us in one bedroom, and then next door there was another family that was like eight of them in one bedroom. And if you, if you, you know, you grew up in Philly or live in Philadelphia, a rural home only has about typically two to three rooms. Um, so this would, this would be a typical scene of uh, people sharing beds, things like that. Um, they're all smiling because <laughs> it's great, you know, we were just so happy to be here, right? Um, but that's a very powerful image in my sense that they're just so happy. Um, and I think that the, the story behind it, it sounds sad, but everyone just looks so relieved. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and memory, memory serves feelings, right? And uh, I, it's more of that joy rather than in a cup of sadness. I wish we could play you the entire presentation, but I encourage you to check out Sarun and the CAGP's work. They do a lot for the Alni community. But Sarun spoke to an important theme of this episode, how family history and lineage get passed down through traditions, including food. Sometimes it's a physical recipe that gets passed down through the generations. Sometimes it's implicitly embedded in a dish like bobor, or sometimes, for some people, that legacy comes in the form of an establishment. Uh, my father is from Daegu, Seoul, the South Korea. And my mother was from North Korea. My, my grandmother and grandfather, they uh, flee the war in the 50s. And my mother was born in South Busan where she, she was just a baby. I, I, I think she was in the belly when they were uh, fleeing from the communism. Sam O oh is the operator of the popular Fifth Street breakfast and lunch destination, PMB Diner. His family used to operate a Korean pastry shop out of the space too, which a lot of longtime Alni residents still remember. We started the bakery because my father's big background when he was in, uh, I think, before teenager, he, he worked in a bakery in Korea. And so he has a good foundation of prepping everything and making the dough finalizing. And that's why he wanted to, uh, he wanted to bring a bakery into the Fifth Street, which is Korean Korean-based community. But it's so funny because people still, you know, say, oh, we wish that that Mr. O was still baking. <laughs> you might recognize that voice from episode one. It's the voice of artist and storyteller Mama Carla Wiley. This is some tape from her quilting project about the businesses of North Fifth Street, which she kindly let us use for this podcast. But uh, it's the same as the mom and pop bakery around the country. They are pushed, pushed away because of the uh, all the supermarkets have their baking facilities mm -hmm. and mom and pop's bakery doesn't have any uh, parking space, the volume that they need to survive. So yeah. they are just uh, changing their business to another. That, that, uh, that's, that's a, um, it's, it's a nature of the business, I think, nature of the capitalism. There's the romance of food as a vehicle of culture on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's the reality of operating a small business. Yes, I definitely could talk about that. Well, as I stated before, I'm staying afloat above waters since last year, maybe March. God is good. Um, I remember closing for one week when it first started, and I was getting phone calls on top of phone calls, and they're like, why are you guys closed? Kadeem Davis is the co-owner of Island Taste, a relatively new Jamaican restaurant on the opposite end of the Fifth Street Corridor from PMB Diner. Davis, along with her partner and co-owner, Nikoi Marsh, are part of a new guard of businesses at spots along the corridor that used to be a Korean purveyors, but now are increasingly occupied by Latin American, Caribbean, and Southeast Asian businesses. Nationwide during the pandemic, 
Black-owned businesses were almost twice as likely to shutter in part because of historical barriers to capital. But as we detailed in an earlier episode, the businesses of North Fifth Street proved to be incredibly resilient. An island taste, which makes some of the best jerk chicken in the entire city, quickly started getting more orders after everything shut down because of COVID. That one week when I, when I closed, I think I lost some of my customers and then they came back probably like a week later because they were probably still wondering like, is, this, is, the, is the restaurant open back up? Is the restaurant open back up? But we stayed, uh, we stayed afloat at above waters in pandemic. And I can tell you this, in, in around pandemic, when, this, when, the, when the place was shut down, I think my sales went up. Honestly, my sales went up. It was like, wow. The whole time during pandemic, even, I mean, now it's slowed down a little bit, but I think I, my business boomed even more during pandemic. Whoa, 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 Linda. You're just going to skip over the jerk chicken? Here, you don't even eat chicken. But yes, she spoke about that too. As far as seasoning, we pretty much doesn't just use powder seasoning to season our food, and that's what makes it authentic. We use ground seasoning, the stuff, like I said, from the ground, and we blend it, and we add it to our to our actual meat products. And that's what gives it the flavor, and it has that authentic Jamaican-ness, um, like the Caribbean Jamaican taste of the food. And when we do our jerk chicken, it's also done outside on a grill. If it's not grilled on an outside grill, it's not jerk chicken. <laughs> the jerk chicken is like literally like if it's not, if sometimes people say, oh, I did jerk chicken and I made it in the oven. No, if it's in the oven, it's not the real, we call it the yardy style. So if you want some real good jerk chicken, you have to do it outside on the grill and you get all the flavors and everything from off the grill and you know that it's like, it, it, it's, it's so good. But Yes. <laughs> The menu at Island Taste tells the story of Kadine and Nikoi's own journeys. She immigrated to Philly from Jamaica as a 10-year-old. He was taught to cook by his grandparents. They serve dishes like a key and saltfish, rice and peas, and of course, oxtail. The restaurant is their livelihood and passion, but it also connects them with special memories. Okay. Um, if I have to speak on culture and um, growing up, um, the first thing I would speak on as far as growing up as a kid in Jamaica and with my grandparents and what they used to cook, we eat three times a day. It's like it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you have to have tea in the morning. A tea is a, is a must. And as far as we call it porridge, if I can think back and think, if I'm, if I'm thinking to talk about cultural, uh, cultural and the food, Porridge and fried dumpling and ackee and sawfish. Those are like the, that's, that's what brings that memory to me when I think about um, back home being around, like my, growing up with my grandparents and my mom and my dad. Um, it was always tea in the morning, porridge. We have different kind of porridges. We have um, like different kind of porridge. It's not just always just one porridge. It's always different porridge that you'll drink. And then you have fried dumplings in the morning with the ackee and sawfish. Those bring back some memory. There are lots of great Caribbean restaurants in Alney. None more delicious than Chez Rosaire on West Tabor Road. The regulars know their orders by heart and give them in Creole. They don't even use a printed menu. My name is Dari. Rosaire is a DBA that I'm using for the business in memory of my late mom. A woman named Dari LeBeau and her husband own the place. And if you don't know what to order, they'll be happy to suggest a platter for you. My menu, it's some um, typical Haitian food, such as goat, uh, chicken, turkey, pork. We have like a typical dish that we make, a uh, black mushroom. It's called Jiggy John John. People have grown accustomed to it. I'll find a lot of... Uh, different backgrounds coming in and ask us for black rice. That's the way they refer to it. That's one of our typical meat, I mean, typical dish, but the the goat as well is very well known in my restaurant. Chase Rosaire cooks a fried pork known as griot, versions of goat and turkey, and that Haitian staple she mentioned, 
Jili Jong Jong, which is flavored by a special mushroom variety unique to Haitian cuisine. Dari didn't sugarcoat how hard it could be to sustain a restaurant. It took a while. It took a while to uh, for the place to pick off from the ground. I had to get back a part-time job on the side delivering newspapers in the morning. Um, it took about six months for people to start coming in. It took about six months. I've always wanted to open a restaurant, but um, the when you're renting a place, the rent alone would just drain me. That So as soon as I was able to get my own place, I decided to convert it into a store restaurant. When we asked what inspired her to start the restaurant and keep going, she didn't hesitate. My mom in her cooking, she enjoyed cooking for us and she always took the time to teach us. Um, she had a saying that says that when you cook, it just it keeps the family, it bounds people together. So yeah, she was uh, my motivation. It's a given when you when you're from um, Haiti, from a very small age, your parents they teach you how to cook because they think it's a powerful tool um, that every woman have to possess, have to have. So I guess for parents, in a way. Um, and I back in the day, she told me, like in her schools, they used to teach them how to sew, how to cook, when she was growing up in Haiti. Food has the power to bind families together, but it also sustains them, which in a community like Alni, during a time like COVID, was extra challenging for a lot of people. In fact, one of the emergency food sources that existed in the neighborhood was the pantry at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, which is run by a parishioner named Tara McFarland. It actually got started long before I had come to the church. We call it Katie's Clubber at St. Paul's Church. St. Paul's is located on the corner of Fifth and Nidro. I happened to take it over by accident when older people just couldn't do it anymore. They, they felt like they couldn't do it all, so I jumped in. So we operate Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 to 12. And we just, we, we provide food for um, the community and at large now since COVID happened. Tara has deep roots here. Her grandparents bought a home in Alni, which she moved into in the early 90s. Her mom works at Lowell Elementary School. She and her family recently relocated, but their work around food security is one thing that keeps them coming back. Her son, Connor, who's about 16 years old, also volunteers at the pantry. So after my mom took it over, uh, she had me come with her a couple of times, uh, you know, to make up bags and do some sock work. And we realized that, the, that where we were needed to be redone in order to produce the way we should. So from that point, my mom and I, we rebuilt shelves and reorganized the room that we have. And from that point, I was there um, throughout the summers. And whenever I didn't have school during the year, I'd be there as well, sometimes on the weekends to help make bags or deal with shipments. And a lot more now since COVID has come because I haven't been in school. Food security has become a form of service for the McFarlands. Food is also what originally brought Connor closer to the church. So the community dinner party was a program that was put together to branch out into our communities. Um, we partnered up with Tabor Lutheran Church to do, uh, I believe it was twice monthly. It was once a month. Sorry, we once were... monthly. Alternated between St. Paul's and Tabor Lutheran Church, where essentially we made, we had a religious free way of bringing people into the church. Um, we, the once a month, it would be a meal made by the host church and um, 
members of the community were free to come in, uh, the dinner, conversation, just overall a good time to get to know people. Uh, a few times during the summer, it was barbecues and different things like that. Unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, we weren't, we haven't been able to continue that as of yet. But my mom and I are working plans to, uh, like a return plan for it. Understanding the importance of food, not only biologically, but socially, psychologically, and spiritually as well, has been more important than ever during the pandemic. Here's Tara. So before COVID, the food pantry only served the Alani community. That's how they had opened up the pantry and that's how they had ran it for a number of years, only 19120. When COVID hit, we opened it to everybody. It didn't matter if you were from Philadelphia, Jersey, Bucks County, it, it doesn't matter where you're from. If you come to our food bank, you get a bag of food. We've noticed it, it's been a huge increase, but it has settled down a little bit. We still have a number of people that found us during COVID and have kept coming back because that need is still there. Uh, we try not to turn anybody away. We normally give one bag of food to a, to a person a month, but if they happen to show up before that and they're in need, we still give them, you know, a supplemental bag. The McFarlands aren't cooking the food for their community, but they're providing for the people that need it. In that way, they're still fulfilling part of the Cesar Chavez quote, the people who give you their food, give you their heart. While researching this episode, we came across a few stories about the legendary restaurant that used to be at 2nd in Alni called Schwarzwald Inn. This place was a throwback to another time. It was started by German immigrants in the 1920s, a family-run place with an authentic German menu. Its popularity spanned over several generations. Even a few VIPs like Frank Sinatra and Harry Belafonte dined there. Even more than the food, the Schwarzwald Inn was classic for its atmosphere. The walls were decorated with cuckoo clocks. They could seat up to 500 people, making it a place for all occasions. Friday night dates, business dinners, holiday banquets, and yes, even a celebrity sighting. You won't find too many photographs of the restaurant online. It closed in the 1990s. But what you will find are people's testimonials on Facebook, comment sections, and blogs. What's clear from reading them is that so many Alni memories got made at this one restaurant, which is one of the amazing powers of food. Its smell, its taste. It can transport you to another place and time in your life. Where the old Schwarzwald Inn used to be is now a bunch of condos. And like so many things in Alni, and communities like it across the city, parts of community's history withers away when we don't preserve memories of the past like the Schwarzwald Inn. And the same could be said about the stories we tried to capture with this podcast. We like to think of these first six episodes of the Audio Alni podcast as somewhat of an archive or audio time capsule, recording memories of the past, stories of today, and dreams for the future. This podcast was created during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and it also serves as a record of the impact the pandemic has had on our ability to come together to share and celebrate culture. We've tried to do that throughout this podcast, and we hope you've enjoyed it. You can find out more about the work of the Cambodian Association of Greater Philadelphia online at cagp.org, or visit them at 5412 North 5th Street. You can visit p and Diner at 6003 North 5th Street. Island Taste is at 5518 North 5th Street and La Calenita is at 5034 North 5th Street. Visit Chez Rosaire at 121 West Tabor Road. It's our final episode of the season. 
You've heard from our hosts, Kier Johnston and Linda Fernandez, our chief sound engineer and designer, June Lopez, along with me, writer and researcher Malcolm Burnley, at times throughout the series. But none of this work would be possible without the leadership and dedication of Only Culture Lab, the producer of this podcast. We'd especially like to acknowledge the executive production team of Ambrose Liu, Verissa McMickens Blair, and Shamor Thomas. Thanks for your vision and for what you do for Olney. As always, you can find more information about our guests' work and this project at www.onlyculturelab.org and search for the Audio Only podcast. You could also email us at audioonly at gmail.com.